Let's be boring just for a few minutes here and talk about the Fed and how it makes its decisions. I don't really like teaching this because it's really simple, but just real quickly here, let's get a feel for how the Fed actually makes its decisions. The Fed stems back to a 1913 decision by Congress, essentially enabling the Fed to do a certain number of things, okay? Prior to 1913, we didn't have a central bank in the U.S. We did have some periods where we jumped back and forth between having central banks with various levels of power. In 1913, the Fed was created um, with some authority, okay? And the main goal of the Fed at this point in time was to stop bank runs. And a bank run is essentially just a scenario where lots of people withdraw their money at the same time from banks. Uh, at this point in time, we did not have a required reserve rate, so banks could decide how much they're going to loan out. And once people start withdrawing money from a bank, that does a couple of different things, okay? One thing that happens when you withdraw your money from a bank is it reduces the effectiveness of the money multiplier. So if, you know, let's think about modern America. If we have a 10% required reserve rate and you take $10,000 out of a bank, that could actually reduce the total money supply by $100,000. So when people start withdrawing money out of the bank, it actually reduces the overall money supply by a great deal, okay? That's one thing it does. Second thing it does, it can create a panic. Since people know that there is money, uh, not enough money in the bank to support everyone who's made deposits, once people start seeing that people are withdrawing money from the banks, uh, it can create an incentive to go get your money out quickly. So essentially, if I hear that you're going to take your money out of the bank, I might try to go get my money out of the bank first so that I know my cash is available to me. Because if I wait and people start withdrawing money out of the bank, maybe my money is nowhere to be found. Okay? So we had these bank runs really common in the early 1900s. It was happening a lot. And this was a primary reason the Fed was started uh, officially back in 1913. Okay? Over time, the Fed got more power and we established a system. This is what it looks like today. All right, so you can kind of picture all the way from 1913 to today, the Fed goes through periods where it gains power, and even just over the last 15 years or so, we've seen the Fed become much more powerful in the choices it can make. So pretty weak in 1913, today, very powerful, okay? That power comes from a couple of different things. Um, one, the Fed is private so it can make its own choices, okay? It's a decentralized system. So the Federal Reserve, not part of the federal government, okay? That being said, Congress can give new powers to the Fed. Um, so right now, if Congress decided it wanted to allow the Fed um, to pay out interest on stock market holdings, so if you buy stocks, maybe the Fed is gonna give you a 1% addition on whatever money you hold in stocks. They could do something like that, right? Congress can create laws for the Fed. So the Fed is private, but it is given additional power from Congress from time to time. So the Fed has gotten more powerful on its own accord. It's basically figured out things that it can get away with and gotten stronger over time. And also Congress has given the Fed more ability to become powerful over time. It's given them new authorities that it can create, such as uh, holding, uh, providing interest on reserves. That was back in 2009, I believe that the Congress first gave the Fed the ability to provide interest on reserves held at the Fed. So they get these new powerful abilities over time. So today, here's how they make decisions. There's a board of governors. And the board of governors contains up to seven members those seven members are appointed by the U.S. president, and then they have to be affirmed by Congress. Um, so when someone is appointed by the president, they go into this, uh, this new Federal Reserve Board of Governors position, and they can serve, to 14 year, they can serve up to a 14-year term. Um, so when you become a member of the Board of Governors, you have 14 years uh, as being a member, and you could also be reappointed. The idea there is, is that monetary policy really needs to be focused on the long run. Um, so if you're there for 14 years, you can really think about the long-term implications of any new policies that you put in. Second reason for that is 
that if you serve 14 year terms, you're probably less likely to be susceptible to political pressure. So if I'm a new board of governor member and I'm pissing off a bunch of politicians, I don't really have to worry about them, you know, not liking me or wanting me out. They really can't do much about it. Um, so once I become a member of the board of governors, it takes a lot for me to be taken out of that position. So I don't have to worry about, you know, making certain political parties or members upset with me. At this board of governors, there is a chair. Right now that is a uh, Jay Powell or Jerome Powell. He's been there uh, a couple years now. Uh, prior to that, it was Janet Yellen. Perhaps you heard of her. Um, prior to that, I believe it was uh, Ben Bernanke. And then before Ben Bernanke was Alan Greenspan. If you follow economics at all, these are probably names you've heard because this is a really, really important person. And part of what makes this person very powerful is unlike the US president, for example, this is a private organization, all right? So Jay Powell can do a lot because he is one of just seven members in this decision-making body of the Board of Governors. So these people have a lot of power because they don't have to worry about getting things passed through Congress or anything. If they wanna pass a new rule, as long as it's within their abilities, right? Then they can do it without asking for permission. There's also the Federal Open Market Committee. FOMC, and this is 12 members. Um, it includes the seven members of the Board of Governors and five additional people that I'll mention here in just a second. This Federal Open Market Committee deals with open market operations, okay? Um, so the Board of Governors has a tremendous amount of power on their own right, and then they're also included in this Federal Open Market Committee, which is a really big job, okay? Because the Fed doesn't just buy bonds and sell bonds to try to manipulate the money supply. They also issue bonds for the federal government, okay? So the federal government needs to borrow money, basically all the time. They call up the Federal Open Market Committee and say, hey, we need to borrow $1 trillion, make that happen for us. And they have to figure out exactly how they're gonna do it. That's a big job, okay? Because if you just issued money in New York City, it might affect the money supply in New York City differently than it affects it in the rest of the country. So it could create some distortions in the economy. So trying to figure out how to borrow a, a trillion dollars is a really big deal. It's a very big job. So not only are they doing open market operations to change the money supply, they're also just facilitating the loans that the U.S. government has. Okay. The Fed has 12 districts. The idea there is that Different parts of the uh, U.S. economy and different parts of the country have different problems at any given moment. And so we need someone keeping an eye on different districts. Each of these districts has its own um, headquarters. So the headquarter of the, uh, the, the district we're in in Milledgeville is in Atlanta. So you can actually go up and visit it if you wanted to. There's a museum there and such. Um, so there's 12 districts, okay? Um, those districts each have a president. And those presidents, five of them, will serve on this Federal Open Market Committee. So the Federal Open Market Committee has seven from the Board of Governors, plus five of these presidents that rotate in and out of this uh, FOMC committee, okay? So this is how decisions get made. Like I said, not very interesting, so we'll move past this right now. So now we're gonna connect the Fed back to the economy. We've kind of already started to get a taste for this, right? Um, if we think about what we did there with the uh, Phillips curves, we're thinking about how the Fed can potentially impact the unemployment rate. Well, we're going to dive even deeper now, okay? Uh, it turns out that the Fed was given three goals by Congress. Back in the 1970s, Congress specifically laid this out, that this is what it wanted the Fed to accomplish. Maximized employment. low inflation, and stable interest rates. These are the three uh, suggestions or mandates, really, they, they, they call this a mandate, in fact, that the Fed had to try to stick to these three goals, okay? Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the dual mandate, which basically refers to the Fed has to think about low inflation 
and also low uh, unemployment rates, okay? Which is obviously gonna be a problem. Um, so if we think about the Phillips curve that we had here, you know, with, with inflation and the unemployment rate, um, it's kind of tough to get low, uh, low values for both of these, right? That, that's kind of what this suggests in, in, in a not so obvious way. Um, basically, you want to be here on the Phillips curve, is, is what this suggests. You want low inflation and you want low unemployment rate. The problem is that's easier said than done um, because if we have high unemployment right now, so for example, if we have high unemployment like this and we have low inflation, generally speaking, what we're going to need to do is bump up the money supply. And as we mentioned before, when you bump up the money supply, it actually could shift this curve up to a higher level. So this is a difficult challenge that the Fed has. It's not impossible, um, but it, it, it's not like these things are independent of one another, and that's what makes things very difficult, okay? If the Fed wants to stimulate employment, oftentimes what that means is raising inflation and dropping interest rates. So doing all three of these at the same time can be a very big problem. Imagine a scenario, for example, if we have unemployment of 10%, inflation of 8%, and interest rates of 4%. Just stealing an example there, okay? If this were to all be happening right now in the economy, you can kind of imagine why this is going to be pretty tough to fix this problem. To get that unemployment rate to drop, the Fed is likely going to have to push up inflation and drop interest rates, which leads to potentially lower unemployment, but higher inflation and some volatility with interest rates. So again, you're going to see that it's difficult to think about these three all together. Okay. Now, why do we need the Fed at all? Um, Getting very granular here and, and thinking about what economics shows us in general, uh, what we learn from classical economics, what we learn from mainstream economics, is that markets normally function well on their own. In other words, if you just leave markets alone, they'll do a pretty good job of managing themselves, okay? I always just imagine just something, a very simple business, like a little ice cream stand at the beach. No one needs to go to that little ice cream stand and tell them that they need to keep prices low or raise prices or hire more workers. No, because they're incentivized to do what's best for society, as it turns out. If that little ice cream stand has prices too high, it won't be able to sell all their ice cream, so it will learn to drop its price. If it sets prices too low, it'll learn that it needs to raise its prices. If it's really profitable, it will hire more workers. It will expand. That good business will generate more wealth for society because it will expand. So you don't really need the government to get involved there. Okay. However, in other cases, we see market failures. And I'm not going to bother with writing down the definition, but a market failure just occurs when the market reaches an outcome that's not best for society. Okay. If you leave some markets alone, the outcome that market will reach will reach it will be bad for society on net okay so for example you can imagine like really hardcore drugs like heroin or something or cocaine um, if we just let those markets be free there will be consequences right if you let heroin and cocaine be completely free that will affect other people it doesn't necessarily mean it should be illegal it just means that it can't be a free market okay Education can't really be a free market. You can't just let people pay for education because that means that lower income people will get no education. And that's a big problem because we all benefit from everyone being educated, all right? It's a market failure. The market will not do a very good job, okay? There's lots of different market failures. Um, and we may talk more about these in the future. There's externalities, open access goods, principal agent problems, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to focus on one really important potential market failure. And that is the market failure of public goods. Public goods, all right? If you've taken some economics courses, you've seen this idea before. Public goods are goods that are non-rival and non-excludable. 
non-rival and non-excludable. Well, in case you haven't seen those terms before, we need to make sure we understand what they mean. Those are kind of terms within a term there. So non-rival basically just means if I can consume it, you can too. It doesn't get used up, okay? A hamburger is rival. If I eat a hamburger, it's gone. You can't use it. But let's imagine we have a really pretty sunset. That's non-rival. If I enjoy the sunset, if I get value from looking at that sunset, that doesn't deter you from also enjoying it. In other words, when I look at the sunset, it's not like I use up that sunset. Me looking at it has absolutely no bearing on whether or not you can look at that sunset and enjoy it, okay? Uh, another pr pretty good example here, a good military, all right? A good military that keeps us safe. If I feel safe from there being a really good military that protects us, that doesn't have any bearing on whether or not you feel safe. In other words, me being safe does not use up some of the safety generated by that military. So it is a non-rival good. Public goods are also, of course, non-excludable. And what this means is there's nothing I can do to stop you from enjoying it. These are very similar ideas, really, but there are some cases where you have one or the other. Um, so, for example, fishing for tuna, right? Fishing for tuna is non-excludable in the sense that I can't stop you from fishing from tuna, but it's rival in the sense that if I catch a tuna, you can't catch it anymore, okay? When it comes to the Federal Reserve and what it's trying to accomplish, we should recognize that it is non-rival and non-excludable. What that means is the benefits generated by the Fed do not get used up as some people enjoy it, and there's nothing you can do to stop anyone from enjoying those benefits generated, okay? As we will see here in a bit, low inflation is non-rival and non-excludable, all right? Low inflation has really big benefits to society. You'll see if we have very high inflation or negative inflation, that can be catastrophic for the economy. So the thing is, when we have low inflation, that makes the economy better, and everyone benefits from that and it's non-rival and non-excludable, okay? In other words, me enjoying low inflation doesn't stop you from enjoying it, and there's not really anything I can do to stop you from enjoying it, right? There's nothing I can do. You're going to enjoy the fact there's low inflation because it's gonna help you get a job, it's gonna help you buy a house, it's gonna do a lot of positive things for you. So what makes this a market failure? The problem with public goods is, it's hard to profit off of them, all right? It's really hard to profit off of public goods because if everyone can enjoy it, why would you ever pay for it, okay? Going back to the military. We spend a lot of money on the military in the United States, but imagine if I went around with just a, uh, a bucket and said, throw in the amount of money you want to pay towards the U.S. military this year, okay? So we're going to get rid of federal funding. We're just going to privatize it, and I'm going to walk around with a bucket, go, go through your neighborhood, and I'm going to say, throw in the money you want to put in towards military. Think about what that would be like, okay? If I took that bucket around and asked you how much money you want to put in, you probably wouldn't put very much. Because if you drop $1,000 in that bucket, you don't really feel safer, right? Because you're just one person. It doesn't really matter how much you put in. It matters how much the other 340 million people put in, okay? So you're probably not going to put very much, and, and there's going to be a tendency to free ride. Everyone's going to hope everyone will pay a lot. Same deal here. There's no way really to profit off of generating a, a low inflation system. Our monetary system doesn't have profitability built into it. It's just hard work, effort, and cost to create low inflation. Okay? So we need the Fed. Without the Fed, there would be no incentive really to create low inflation. Because low inflation makes all businesses more profitable. It wouldn't just make some individual private bank profitable, you see? So if we privatize this, we would be prone to very high inflation, 
negative inflation because no one would care enough to overlook the system, all right? So let's talk about why inflation is so important. We can kind of categorize inflation into uh, three groups, okay? One would be that very scary scenario of hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is when prices are rising at an incredibly fast rate, all right? Hard to define exactly what hyperinflation is. Like, I don't know really what the threshold is, but when you see it, you know it, okay? So hyperinflation is when prices are not only rising, not only are prices rising fast, but the inflation rate is rising. All right, that's two different things. What I mean by that is, if the inflation rate in 2020 is 40%, that means you have inflation, very high inflation. That means prices are going up 40% during this year, okay? But with hyperinflation, it's not only that prices are high and rising, it's that the inflation rate itself is rising, okay? So you can kind of think of it this way. Uh, it's first derivative positive and also second derivative positive, I guess. Okay. Not only are prices going up, they're rising at, an, at a faster and faster rate over time. Okay. Once this gets going, there's really no way to stop it. All right. Once prices start to go up, it creates very powerful incentives. If I know that prices are rising very quickly, I'm going to take whatever money I have and spend it as fast as I possibly can. And when people spend their money as fast as they possibly can, it pushes up prices, which creates an incentive to spend even more money, right? You also would probably try to get away from US dollars if we had inflation like this. You'd, you'd wanna get paid in something else, gold, Bitcoin, euros. And as you're trying to liquidate your US dollars, those dollars will lose value, all right? So hyperinflation, definitely a disaster. Um, famously, this happened in Zimbabwe back in, I think, 2005. They reached an inflation rate of six sextillion percent at one point, which is this number here. One more. So that was their inflation rate at one point in 2005. That means the prices are going up unfathomably fast. When you go to the grocery store, there are no prices listed on anything. You go to the register, you have no idea what you're going to be paying. And the amount of currency that needs to be generated to facilitate this is massive. So people are using wheelbarrows to push their money to the grocery store. Really a total catastrophe, all right? And it's one of those, as an economist, that bothers me because it's just bad policy, all right? It, it, this doesn't ever need to happen. So hyperinflation is obviously very bad. A bit more subtle is the effects of inflation that's too low deflation. This is when we have prices dropping and the value of the dollar increasing. Okay. By the way, just to be clear, these mean the same thing. All right. If prices are going uh, down 10% per year, that means that every dollar is worth 10% more, right? If you have a dollar bill and things are getting cheaper, that dollar is gaining value. So this is really the same definition here, okay? And we need to understand why this is a problem, okay? And there's a couple reasons why. Uh, one reason this is a problem that I may have made reference to before when we have deflation, it tends to cause people to wait to make purchases. You know, they're still going to buy their groceries and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, the things you don't have to have right now, you're definitely incentivized to wait to purchase. And I've kind of seen this in my own life to some extent. Can I show you guys something real quick right now? I'm going to mess up my video, but look at that big TV. Woo! I'm going to watch a lot of sports on that. I just bought it. And part of the reason I waited to buy a TV for so long is because TVs kept getting cheaper and cheaper over time, right? TVs have dropped in price dramatically year over year. And the incentive there is, if you know prices are dropping on TVs, well, you, you wait, 
right? Wait to buy a TV. Wait until they get a bit cheaper. And if they're always dropping, just wait, wait, wait. The problem is when you have deflation for the overall economy, everyone's waiting to buy stuff, right? You might buy your milk, you might buy your bread, but you wait to buy those new cars, you wait to buy the new houses, and that becomes a really big problem. When people wait to make purchases, that hurts the economy. All right, I think that one's kind of obvious once you start to think about it. If prices are going down, people will wait to make purchases, and that hurts the economy right now, all right? That's one problem with deflation. Another problem with deflation, we made reference to this one before as well. When prices drop, people may hoard money. When prices are going down, that means that every dollar is gaining value. So you might feel compelled just to hold on to your money, all right? If money is gaining value over time, maybe you don't buy stocks, maybe you don't buy bonds, maybe you just hold the cash. When people are holding cash, that also hurts the economy. All right, so you get ultimately the same effect, even though it's a very different way to think about things. Now, in both cases, what you really have here is money not moving around. But this is more problematic because I'm not just saying that they won't spend the money. They might also not save the money in the economic sense. They might not put money, as, money in the bank, right? They may just hold it at their house, which means that money can't multiply, can't go into the economy, could be really problematic. And a third reason why this is problematic is it makes profiting difficult to achieve for banks. So you can kind of imagine here, um, you know, just a very simple scenario. Maybe I deposit $10,000 in 2020, and then I withdraw that same money of $10,000 in 2025, okay? So this is like putting your money into a checking account that earns 0% interest. Probably everyone watching this video is doing this right now. You have money in a checking account at 0% interest, right? Now, think about this scenario in normal times. If we have 2% inflation, you're kind of losing a little bit of value there, right? If we have 2% inflation and you have your money in here for five years, well, your money's losing a little bit of value over time, but you're probably willing to accept that because you need money in checking. You like having money in checking, right? Because it gives you flexibility to accessing it quickly, it keeps it safe, it gives you some benefits. Now imagine if you have 2% deflation. From the bank's perspective, what that means is the bank, under the case of deflation, the bank loses wealth, if we can call it wealth, from these transactions. Now why is that the case? Well, when you gave the bank $10,000, it was worth $10,000 at that time, right? When you withdraw those $10,000 in the future now, under the assumption of deflation, the $10,000 are now worth more. So what that means is every time people put money in a bank and then withdraw that money from a bank, they're withdrawing more value than they put in, okay? If this is 10% deflation, right? If we have negative 10% inflation rates, then that means this $10,000 you're pulling out is more than twice as valuable as what you put in. Doesn't sound like a very profitable situation for the bank, right? They bring in money and then they pay out money that's worth twice as much when they return it. So it's gonna be really hard for the banks to make money. So what the banks might decide to do is drop interest rates below 0%, right? The banks might change this so that when you withdraw your money, maybe you're only withdrawing $5,000 in 2025. Sounds reasonable, right? If you can't make profits, you gotta figure out a way to create some profitable um, situations in your monetary system, okay? Of course, if you offer this opportunity now, this is negative interest rates. I put money in and that money erodes over time. 
Well, again, now I'm back to hoarding money, all right? So this isn't gonna work. 